Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Shop Still Podcast, a podcast for woodworkers and the maker community in general. This is episode number 22. My name is Robin Lewis from RobinLewisMakes.com. I'm joined by Joey Chalk from King Post Timberworks. Hello. And John Crawford from Periodic Furniture Studio. Yay. We live stream the recording on YouTube every Thursday evening at 7 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time or UTC plus 10. Or you can watch or listen to it later on YouTube, iTunes, or SoundCloud. I want to say hello to everyone in the chat. We'll get to your comments and questions towards the end of the show, but feel free to chat amongst yourselves. The idea being that this is also a place for people to meet. Um, so in terms of announcements, before we get started, um, John, do you want to just give us a quick rundown of um, your event that you were at recently? Yeah, okay. So this weekend just gone. So I think that would have been the 14th or something like that. Uh, the Perth Wood School had a open day. I should turn my phone on silent. Uh, the Perth Wood School had a open day, and I attended that on behalf of TimberCon, which is one of our bigger, bigger um, woodworking shops here in Australia. And yeah, it was pretty cool. I had a lot of you guys come up and say hello and shake my hand and give the uh, manager of the store the impression that I was a celebrity, which is not the case. <laughs> not an impression. Fun. You are a celebrity. Well, in my own mind, but not to anyone else. <laughs> but yeah, it was good fun. There was a few mobs down there. I think it was, uh, gosh, there's a, is it Lee Valley? I can't remember. Mm. But we had a cool hand, hand planes and all that mm. down there. And there was a sawmill operating out the back. Uh, what else was there? Actually, something which I thought was a great concept to have at one of those events was a bookshop. They had a bookstore and it was just full of woodworking books like oh, chair making yeah. and bench making and joinery techniques. And That's cool. If I had money with me, I would have probably bought a few books because it was super fun. But yeah. So time. what was your what was your role there? Like what, what were you doing? Oh, I was just selling stuff and standing ah. behind the stall, just being the face of the brand more than anything. Like we weren't there with the intention to sell heaps of stuff. We we're just there to say, hey, here we are, this is what we have, and um, you know, have a, had a few new product lines and stuff on display. So, yeah, I guess it was more of a marketing ploy for TimberCon than a sales event, which was nice because mm -hmm. it meant that we, were, we weren't sales-driven, we were customer-driven. So it was yeah, yeah. actually having a chat, giving advice, or you know, just having a yarn and that sort of um, like-minded zone, which was cool. So if the, if the manager there didn't know that you had any kind of online presence, how did you end up with that gig? I spend a lot of money there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that's basically a, the, the key to life is as long as you spend enough money, you can go places. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so his name's Ray. And back when I was still in high school, he owned or managed one of the bike shops around my area. And I bought a bike off him when I was probably 15. Um, and then, you know, he was my go-to guy for right. all the servicing. So we always, we were quite familiar with each other for a few years. Um, and then when he took over that store and I walked in there one day, he said, oh, hey, we need some help around the shop every now and again. Would you be interested? And I said, well, there's no harm in asking. I spent <laughs> enough money with you bastards. I might as well make some back. <laughs> <clears throat> and by bastard, I mean that lovely, lovingly because they are awesome bunch of people. Yeah, that's cool. So this, is this going to be an annual thing or has it been an annual thing? Um, I think it is an annual event that the Perth Wood School puts on. And uh, as most of us know now, Carbotech has pulled out of all show events across mm. the board. Um, so I believe I have no actual evidence to... Uh, back this up, but I believe TimberCon is now upping their game to attend more right. of the events right. along the lines, just so they have the presence. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't work for them, so don't take this as gospel. It's just my impression. <laughs> I see Ian in the chat has just mentioned um, he likes, there's a, I can't remember if it's on YouTube or Facebook, but TimberCon do a cool tool Tuesday, like a little um, yeah, yeah. segment. And it was only just a couple of weeks ago that I got onto that. And it, it is really interesting, some of the, the tools that they mention in it. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know if that ties in with what you're saying, George. Maybe TimberCon really is trying to, as you say, up their game. 
Yeah, I think they definitely um, are doing more and more to kind of just branch into that new modern age of marketing like we, we are seeing a lot of in America. And mm. from my standpoint, it would be great if they got more into the sponsoring YouTubers with, you know, a few mm. little bits and pieces <laughs> just because we haven't got anyone local doing that yet. And it could be a cool area for them. But obviously at this stage, they are focusing on their own production of Cool Tool Tuesdays and meet the, um, they, they do another thing called Meet the Maker or something. Mm. Okay. Where they have a few furniture makers they've showcased. So yeah. I mean, they're, they're doing cool things. I like them. And, like, obviously, I wouldn't back them if they weren't a good company. So mm. it's nice to actually have that small business mentality around woodworking supplier. It's just really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of um, um, upping their game and, and doing more with YouTubers, that kind of thing, I want to do a quick shout out to one of the listeners, Dan Brent. He's, um, I met Dan through an online forum probably about six months ago. He's a very cool guy. He just recently put, recently put me in touch with a, um, a festival expo coming up in the future. I don't want to mention names yet because, you know, nothing's been set up uh, in stone yet. But I had a very interesting phone call this week with the organizer of this event and they are putting in, it's it's a very modern new school event, and they are putting in a big emphasis on the YouTube side of it and, and trying to market to the younger generation, which is which is where the conversation with myself yeah. and, you know, the, the Shop Still Podcast Extended came in. Yeah. Um, but it seems like there are a lot of people in, you know, these these brands that are now tuning into that idea of we can put our brand out and make it cool, funky, hip, yeah. You know, and and not have that old woodworking stigma behind it. Yeah, that's cool. And, and they mm. can make it modern. So yeah, hopefully this is hopefully this is the start of some really good things with the industry. Because this this was for those of you who don't know, this was one of the the main reasons we started this podcast is we're trying to get the YouTube community involved in this this movement. Um, so it's good to hear that this sort of stuff is happening. Yeah, definitely. Good. All right. Um, so then, as per the usual scheduling, let's do a quick rundown of what we're all working on. Joey, do you want to take us away? I've, I saw your Instagram post about your desk this week, so you probably <laughs> yep. got some stories. Well, I, I just finished my desk this afternoon, put it in place. Um, it is uh, there. There is not one part of that desk that went according to plan. So, like literally every step was a battle there's there's bogged up holes where there shouldn't be holes there's <laughs> little pieces cut out where there shouldn't be pieces cut out um the hardware was an absolute nightmare the veneering was a nightmare um you name it it was not fun so i'm glad that it's just done and usable and it looks pretty in the in the um lounge so that's good <laughs> Um, what what uh, timber was it that you used? It's a the veneer, the, the face oh. veneer is curly walnut. Oh yeah. yeah. Yes, that's right. It's that, it was that fancy schmancy um, yeah. stuff that you had. Uh, Did the had it, rippling um, from the press uh, it, go down? It kind of it kind of did. There's a patch which is quite bad. Um, if it wasn't curly grained timber, it would just look terrible. But the timber is so curly with a cross kind of cross wave in it that you can't see the vertical rippling that's there. Um, so that's kind of nice. If you touch it, you can feel it, which is no good. <laughs> um, and it's actually, funnily enough, the rippling is dead rock hard as well. You can't push it in, Yeah, right. which is interesting. So there's no way to like, you know, people had suggested I syringe and glue and push it down there's, just, there's no flexibility so it's really strange i haven't really come across that before so and is there enough veneer uh, there to sand through it or, or not no I'd, i would have just gone right through right. if i'd sanded through those lumps so i had to be quite careful actually when i was doing the finishing this was a commercial veneer wasn't it like 0.3 mil not shops on 0.6 yeah um, not too bad but yeah wouldn't risk not it too bad but no there's no way i was gonna get too carried away um, <laughs> I, I noticed that it was a lot lighter than the walnut that i'm used to seeing yeah in in like the us in the U, the the us videos yeah. yeah so 
So I think there's a couple of reasons. Generally, air-dried timber is lighter than the kiln-dried, especially right. with walnut. You tend to notice that the kiln-drying process tends to like darken up the tannins. And oh, you're, you're meaning the um, color. I was thinking weight. Okay, got you. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. the tone is lighter, I should say, although that could be emotional. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah i would would have preferred it actually to look a bit darker in the room but I, it will definitely darken up um the federal desk that i made a, a couple of years ago was the same color uh and now it's quite dark so and um, it will just darken up with a bit of sunlight so mm. that should be fine um i was complaining last week about not having well, any work come in wasn't really complaining but just um stating effect and so I'd been chasing people and making things kind of happen. And as I kind of expected, everything's come in at the same time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now I'm snowed under. I just went and bought 20 sheets of plywood for a couple of bookcases. So that'll keep me going for a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Are those going to be painted? Uh, uh, yeah, they're going to be painted Two two different jobs built in. Um, Ah, uh, built into okay. Yeah, completely different to each other, but um, kind of trying to do. Actually, they're two different types of plywood as well, just for different budgets, and so just trying to keep track of which is which and what are we doing. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a bunch of little points here of things that have come up during the week. Um, let's see, an interesting little thing. I've been talking to this lady about a kitchen island, a walnut kitchen island that's going to be like three meters by one point two. Been talking to her for two and a half years about this job, hmm. and finally the house is being built. The, tr the trusses are going on, and it's time to start getting serious about this thing. Um, she came to me to do the island because her kitchen manufacturers couldn't work with the solid timber, and now she's concerned that the kitchen guys aren't going to be able to actually do what she wants. So I'm now pricing up the rest of the kitchen. Nice. Yeah, part of the concern is that she has paid them five thousand dollars for drawings, and that's Whoa. it. And yes. um, so I was. She told me that she's like, I know we're five grand in, but maybe at this point we're thinking we should just cut our losses because we're not so sure that these guys are, um, you know, a hundred percent on our side. And I was kind of like, wow, five grand sounds about like half the cost of your complete kitchen. So well, I was going to say, is that what <laughs> drawings normally go for? Because Jesus, that's a lot of money. I, well, I, some companies can get away with doing it. I just I thought it was an interesting little, you know, there are people doing that and people willing to pay, presumably. But um, it sounds like they are, they, they have, this company have given them like a complete, We'll buy everything. We'll do all the project management. Just give us your money and you'll get a kitchen. And so doing that, you can add on lots of percentages for mm. um, project management fees and all this kind of rigmarole, mm. which just is an easy money earner. And it's usually actually easier if a client just goes and buys their own stuff and gives it to me. <laughs> That's way mm. easier. So um, it's just an interesting little thing. Um, the other thing I thought I would bring up I'm doing a, I think I mentioned it last week, another extension table like the one I just built. Yeah, you did. The open yeah. cherry one. Um, and I'm cheating a bit because this guy's not paying as much money. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Fair speed, I guess. Yeah, I'm, I'm cheating on the breadboard ends a bit. And I've used the domino to make some big wide mortises. And I've just this afternoon, I glued in some plywood tenons. Um, and so then tomorrow I can put my breadboards on and I'm thinking what I'm going to do on this job is just run my dowel from the bottom side only. So it doesn't come right through just so you, um, sometimes I just don't like the look of the dowels coming all the way through. Mm. And I noticed Jordan on your tables that you've just finished. Yeah. Uh, you don't have dowels coming through the top either. So no, what did I, you I stopped those. So like I had... How thick? So the top is 36 mil thick. Yeah. So I put the stop on my drill collar at, I think it was 32 mil. So yeah, it, that's what I'm thinking. So it goes it. through the tannin and still has a fairly good chunk of material yeah. to bite into, but it doesn't get exposed. So I, don't, yeah. I don't particularly like that exposed look. And with the mm. drawing it out as well, I've 
had more times where it's chipped. That's right. The grain coming out and I have to patch it and I have had success. So I stopped doing it. Yeah. That's yeah. Something I just kind of, kind of just hit me the other day. I was like, I don't need to go all the way through like the back of that. <laughs> it, it does help if you're doing a drawboard because you can yeah. like, you can really nail it through and you can have a severe like taper on the end and then you just yeah. cut it on both sides. But yeah, that's true. Yeah. Cause I guess then you're pulling on two points as opposed to, what one and a half at mm, best. Yeah. yeah, but I don't like it, so I don't. Yeah, good cool. So yeah, uh, Joey, with the with the uh, domino uh, yep. breadboard ends, yep. are you still doing the um, what do you call it? The notched. Um, what do you call tenon. it? Haunch tenon. Are you still? Are you still no. doing? Okay, because I was going to ask because I've seen when when I was so I doing. I don't like them. That's why I don't like domino breadboards because there's no. Um, haunch all the way along. So when I was doing my dining table, I was researching all these ways to do breadboard mm -hmm. ends, and I kept seeing people with their stupid dominoes <laughs> just shooting holes in and sticking the board on, and thinking that's yeah. so much easier. It's um, easy, but it's it's not. I don't think it's I mean, if you've got a tight join, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, potentially, there's an issue that if, when stuff moves a little bit, yeah, you could get at the right angle, and you can see light coming right through the the dry joint um, yeah. Yeah. there's a potential for that to happen um, which I don't like so that's re you know, really the only downside I suppose I mean there's other downsides but um, so yeah and I didn't want to use just like a 30 mil wide domino so I've created like a 60 mil wide slot and made plywood tenons instead mm -hmm. and we'll see how that goes tomorrow <laughs> oh, cool the last week you were talking about there was a pretty tricky customer. It was a lady. And you had just oh, been yes. on the phone yeah. with her. What was the outcome of, of that? Um, so she came back to me and said, I think I had said she asked me to route out the bottom of the shelves and drop the yes, shelves that's right. it was the, the shelf pins. Yeah. 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 So she did that. And I said, okay, I don't think that's going to look any better than shelf buttons, but I come and do it. Uh, it's going to be an hourly rate because it's not part of the job. Um, and she just like came back within like five minutes and said, fine, just give me my money back. <laughs> so that's what so I did. I gave, gave her half the money, money back. Is that right? Yeah. No wow. deposit though. I kept the deposit. No problem there. No, no. I, she had paid me in full for this job. And oh, okay. she had ordered two of these shelving units. And for complicated reasons. One of them was meant to be different, but I didn't mm. get that message. So I gave her the money back for the one that was supposedly wrong. And, um, and that was it. Oh, sounds like a, a vaguely happy ending then after all. <laughs> I don't like losing, you know, a few hundred bucks, but, um, sounds like you need the time else. at the moment then. Yeah. I was just like, well, I can't fix it. I can't make you happy. So I really yeah. just wanted her to say, give me my, my money back because in that situation, um, anything I did was going to cost me way more than giving her half the money mm -hmm. back. Um, it was really getting to the point of rebuilding it. So it's like, well, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Well, so that's me. Fun. Jordan, we already got onto your tables. Do you want to tell us the rest of the story? Yeah, so uh, where, where, where am I? Uh, this week, I have finished off the tables which I was doing last week, which is the two matching 3.2 meter long dining tables. And in fact, I delivered those today. So that was That's... a 370k round trip. Sure. Which uh, sucked. <laughs> Happy but, customer, yeah. though. Yeah, well, you know, they're they're a commercial customer, so the people that are paying uh, no idea. Yeah. They're not even there. They're, <laughs> they're 300 k's yeah. away. Mm -hmm. um, but all of the people that were there loved it. So Palmerston Association is a drug and alcohol rehabilitation center, and that's, mm -hmm. that's where the client was. And this is a relatively new... Um, the word escaped me when I was there as well. Uh, what was it? New. Okay. Yeah, like... Estab not facility. establishment facility that's what i'm looking for yeah. yes. <laughs> it's a new facility of theirs so um they're still kind of getting everything in order but when the tables got in there it really tied it all together and cool. all of the kind of helpers um and volunteers loved it so that was awesome 
And and how did you get the sale in the first place? Uh, I've done their other facility here in Perth. I did their tables. So it's mm. kind of like a repeat business um, deal. And the way I got that first job was actually through a watcher of my YouTube videos that put them on to me. So huh. it was kind of cool. Did you, um, now, you used the monocoat stuff. I did, yeah, first give, time. Give, give us information. <laughs> okay, so first thing that happened, there's like a backstory to how hell <laughs> table finishing was because my wide drum sander it uses pneumatics for belt tracking right. and one of the pneumatic cylinders failed. So I was down to just having one drum, which is the one the platen, which is 0.1 millimeter maximum depth of cut. Jeez. So I ended up having to stay here until uh, how late was it? It was 11.15 p.m. on Tuesday, the just same. doing the underside. Oh, my God. And then <laughs> yeah. because I didn't have the, both the belts running, it has this ripply effect that you get through the sanding. And the right. thing with the Rubio Monocoat is the finish is as good as your sanding. So if you want it to be glossy, you sand up to like 500, 600 grit. Right, if you okay. want it to be matte, you leave it at 240, 300. Jeez. And I was going for somewhere in the middle, yeah. which was 320, but it was just hours of sanding, like ridiculous <laughs> amount. And uh, yeah, so Ellen actually helped me out for a little bit of it. So that was the first time she's been in the shop for a while and yeah. I made her breathe in all this fine dust and sanding, <laughs> but uh, I don't think she'll be back anytime soon. Uh, <laughs> the plan worked. No, joking. Um, so anyway, the, the Monaco, at the end of the day, after hours and hours of prep work because of the failure there, went on and the first coat I did, which was the undersides and one base, I used 70 grams of oil, which yeah. is crazy. nothing, like a tiny yeah. small amount. And I had a little bit left over in the cup and that just, it came out phenomenal. I couldn't believe the finish that I got, even though that was the rough sanded side. And you, that was ragged on? It uses like, um, you know, the 3M oh, stuff, right? buffing pad things oh really i i was using one of them because that's what the salesman um kind of demonstrated and he gave me a few pads included in the sale right but i found that that wicked up quite a bit of the oil so it was i got to about halfway through the first table and then it started spreading a lot better so obviously it kind of had pre-saturated the pad right um, and then you kind of wait about 10 minutes and then you go to the fine, like the white, which is the extra super fine. And you kind of huh. wipe it off with that. This, off this with guy. It. Yeah, that, that guy right yeah. there. Uh, and then you give it a, a bit longer and then you just wipe it off with a clean rag and whatever's stuck to the wood fiber is, is your finish. Huh. Um, the top coat, which was sanded to 400 grit, on the top, I used, I think I mixed up 80 grams and I had 20 grams left. So I only needed Jesus. 60. And I did the two tops, all the edges, and one base, the other base. Mm. And I, I've wasted probably enough to finish another table. Do you think that because if you didn't sand to a fine grit, it would just soak up way more? And it's because the sanding has kind of burnished the top that it's not soaking in a, a heck of a lot? I think that has a lot to do with it. And I think that's also why they give such a broad coverage range right. in a container because they say 35 to 50 square meters per liter, which is like a massive, yeah, massive. Like double. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think that's got a lot to do with it. Right. What I ended up doing uh, on the second batch, though, which worked a lot better, was I used my fingers like in a rubber glove and I spread yeah. it out really thin. Yeah. And then I went over it with the pad to kind of push yeah. it down into the wood. And the way that this oil apparently works is on the molecular, like bonding okay. to the timber under underneath. So it doesn't soak in any deeper than like the micron, not, not even yeah, like a couple of microns. Yeah. So anything that is left pooling on top of the surface is waste. So you don't right. want any when you're applying it. You want it to be as thin as possible. Um, but and so did the, the 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 leftover in the cup go hard? Yeah, it did. So. 
it comes with a hardener. You don't need yep. easy hardener, but if you don't, it takes three weeks for it to fully cure or close to three days. So yeah. right. um, in that cup today, it had probably, it was probably about five mil deep in the bottom of the, it was only a little cup. Yeah. Um, and I'd say three quarters of that has was hard and I managed to pull that out and I pulled a little bit out with my finger and just patched a little bit of my work mesh and it was mm. still, still good. But, I mean, I'm not going to say it's well justified spending $400 on a litre can of this stuff, but yeah. seeing how far it's going and the fact that I left it out in my workshop, it was covered in dust by the time I got back the next day and I just wiped it off and the finish was still perfect. It's enough for me to recommend it to anyone. And, yeah. like, you know, I, I have um, their factories right next door to me well, not right next to it, but down the road for me. And they've told me that if you want to kind of on-sell it, here's the retail list, here's your list. Oh, and, you know, I, I can I can sell it on behalf of them at retail prices to anyone and I just call them off and they'll drop it off to me. Jeez. So it's That's pretty kind, cool. of, kind of cool to just say that I have the full supporting range of right. uh, monocoat maintenance oils and blah, blah, blah. Are you getting a 5% cut for that then? And I get a 5% <laughs> cut. I mean, I, I'm not doing it, but if someone wants it, I'm happy yeah. to kind of bring it in for him. Sweet. So uh, now you're well, working for Simbicon and Monocoat. <laughs> well, no, I'm just I'm just on sale, sale retailing for them. Uh, Stumbling yeah. over your words, but it, it's cool. <laughs> it's cool. Like, it, I don't know. I, I need more time with it to really get behind it 100. percent But so far, I'm impressed. Looks good. Just yeah. a, just a quick question. I noticed you were talking about the measurements in weight as opposed to. Mills. What milliliters or volume? That's because I didn't go and buy a syringe. So. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. I use my mixing stick and then I would pour it, like hold the, actually I've got a stick right here and I'll hold it over the, the cup and when it'll stop dripping, I'll get a little bit more out of the can because it's like, right. oh, it's worth its weight. Yeah. I just wondered if there was some reason why you used weight instead of no, everything it was, else. It was just because I forgot to get, get the stuff I needed. Right. Cool. Yeah. Um, I've been doing some other stuff this week. So I've, I've got another commission that I've started today, just machining all up the uh, timber on. That didn't make any sense. Started machining <laughs> all of the timber for. There we go. <laughs> uh, which is a stance table, one of my standard grains. Oh, cool. It's a bit wider. And I've had, uh, you know, that little cabinet I did, which was whitewashed base. And yep. Yeah which was kind of hard to do. Um, well, delivered that and she loves it. She's stoked, but now she wants a three sided mirror, which she can hinge the doors in and she wants beveled glass and she just wants that to mount onto the back of it. Mm. So I have to price that up because beveled mirrors are not cheap. So I, no. I doubt she'll go with it, but that's what she wants. So she might, I mean, she paid to have that piece of poo refinished, <laughs> so she might. Does she want the mirror to have the same kind of intricate carving on the? No, no. So she just wants it to be like a pretty slim frame, but to match the top. And I'm pretty sure that's uh, okay. Oregon, so it'll be easy. Uh, and uh, what else? I mean, there's been a lot of running in and out and doing small jobs here and there, but they're boring and no one cares about that. So no. I'll uh, throw it over to you, Robin. I was going to do a football reference, but I couldn't think of one. <laughs> <laughs> so, that is so un-Australian that you can't even think of a football. Now right? I'm going to handball it over to you. There we go. There we go. As as the the token foreigner, I was yeah. I hate the fact that I know more about it than you do. Yeah. Uh, so this week, I've I'm still been on my bathroom renovation. Um, slowly moving through it. Uh, I've got the electrics in this week, so I've gone from having these crappy um, wall mounted. Uh, light switches inside the bathroom with wall mounted three core um, <laughs> Romex oh. running up to a horizontal fluorescent bulb on the wall. <laughs> real, real stylish. Pulled all of that out and I've got three um, down lights in the, the bathroom and one in the um, toilets all running to a single gang or a three gang single switch outside. Yeah. So much. It's amazing how. You just update the lights and suddenly the entire room is, is just yeah. transformed. It's suddenly modern. 
So that got done. Uh, today, the plumber came in. So I installed, I finished the bath hob this week. It's quite a, quite a particular, quite an interesting design. What you normally do is you notch the, the, the bath into the studs in, in a corner. So whatever corner the bath goes into, you notch it into the studs and then you, you, you put your sheets over that. Now, because my bathroom is, all the sheets are asbestos, I, I, try to, I try to leave them in place. I didn't want to pull, just stop pulling them off. Yeah. So what I decided to do was build the hob 90 mil off the wall and sit the bath in that. And I got halfway through and then I thought, oh, but now I'm going to have all the water pooling <laughs> on, in that inside corner. Oh, that's it. So on the fly, I thought, oh, I, a brilliant idea. Let me build up a little shelf around the inside corner which of course from the start was my plan because that's where you're going to put all your shampoo bottles and stuff you know <laughs> brilliant idea um so it was a little bit complicated well a bit more complicated than it needed to be but i finished that today um i've sheeted everything the plumber was here today hooking up the waste on the bath i installed the bath two days ago for the first never done a bath before it was Joey. I almost got onto a text message with you and saying, "Please, just I don't know what to do. Just give me something." Um, but got through it. Um, it's nice and solid. It's in a little bit of mortar. You know, there's there's no bounciness in it or no um, bonginess. I guess you'd call. Yeah. Call it. And um, yeah, plumber came in today, hooked it up. All the sheets are on. I've primed all of them. Tonight, I'm going to have to silicon all the joints and then I'll get a waterproofer in. He'll just right. come in and check it and then do the final waterproofing. So, Sweet. fingers crossed. Hopefully, this weekend I'll be tiling. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Fun. Taking so much longer than I thought. I'm yeah. still I'm still enjoying it, but it's taking so much longer than I thought. But now that I'm on to this stage where I'm putting the tiles up, all of the, the nervousness is sort of gone because now it is what it is. Yeah. Like... All the all the, the technical stuff, the hard stuff is done. There's nothing more I can do. So now I've now I'm onto the jobs that I know and and it should be a little bit more enjoyable. Are you, are you getting a bit of a hurry along from the missus? Yes, yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> basically I, I I won't go into too many details, yeah. but for those of you who've who've been following the last uh, following along the last couple of months, I have a little one on the way. Yeah. And a couple of weeks ago, we found out that our little one is in a hurry to jump out. Uh -huh. So it's actually, gonna it's it's about three weeks. Um, the, the the little thing isn't growing fast enough. Right, right. They're gonna have to induce it three weeks earlier. Jeez. So <laughs> get it move on. Yeah. So with our with our um. So how many weeks does up, that leave you, leave you with? So it's gone from the seventh of June to three weeks before that. So we're like middle of right. May. So well, just after the show. Well, I hope it's just after the show. Otherwise I'm gonna have to literally drop the mic and jump on the, <laughs> you know, this <laughs> earliest flights I can get back. So we'll see. But yeah, so so to answer your question, yeah, there is a bit of hurrying along because there's still some other jobs that need to get done as well. So yeah. Um, okay. uh, just a quick question, or a question there from Ian, how many weeks with no bathroom? So it's been, four or five weeks that we've been showering outdoors and Jesus, the, the the temperature is starting to dip now so when i go for my morning run and i come back at about 6 30 that is a that is a cold cold shower <laughs> in the morning sounds oh, cold well yeah um i mean it's it's yeah it's not fun but it could, it could be worse yeah. Wife. yeah no it's um i think the amount because of the amount of money that we save yeah, we'll, I, we'll we'll keep yeah. doing this, yeah. but yeah, both of us are starting to get to the end of our tether now. It's yeah. just, it's just, there's just, there's just crap everywhere, and the 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 bathroom joins onto the kitchen, so the kitchen's just a disaster. Yeah. It's just dust everywhere. Uh, yeah, I'm just done with it now. Yeah. Cool. Right. So let's, the, let's do so a podcast about something. <laughs> yeah. So that that's my my story. Let's move on to the tonight's topic, which is this was something that that Jordan suggested. Um, it's basically about the hardware that we use um, on our projects what's a good type of hardware what's a bad type of hardware what sort of style of hardware you would use for different projects um, I know we've jo Joey you've recently had some issues with your 
your hinges on your yeah. desk. Um, <laughs> did you end up getting those hinges to work or did you end up having to get some new type of hinges or? Um, so I bought a set of hinges. Theoretically, they would do the job. And I must say, this is for my desk. And I mean, I think I won't say I'm pushing the boundaries of like mechanics, but I'm, I'm really using. <laughs> <It's the boss>. <laughs> no, but definitely is pushing the um, general hardware range. Like what I want to do is pretty modern and what I have done. And um, there's not much hardware made for it. And even when you talk to the people in the know, they're, they're like, hmm. Then they think, pause. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when that happens, you know that, um, you know, you may may or, not, may or may not work. But when I, what I wanted to say for this topic really was my first response is I use whatever is going to work for the job because it's because I do such different stuff. Um, but mainly it's about finding a place, a supplier of hardware that are reliable, is service oriented, and um, they have a decent help desk and they know what they're talking about. If you can find a, a group of people with those qualities, like stick with those people. And I've found a few, I've got probably four places like who supply different types of hardware and they just, they understand my technical jargon when I call and ask for uh, whatever it happens to be. And I'm sure there are other companies who are just as good. But at the moment, I don't need to branch out. I've found my go-to guys, and I'm like sticking with them because I, you know, you start getting a, a rapport with these people, and um, I think that's kind of the best way to, to go ahead. So, mm -hmm. um, I I would give it for anyone in New Zealand. I'll give a shout out because probably someone's going to ask me. There's a company called Technical Equipment on the North Shore of Auckland. They have anything you want, or they can get it no matter what um, they're a little tricky to deal with because they just, they've got 20,000 different ops um, pieces in their warehouse. And so, you know, sometimes it's difficult to actually get what you want uh, or get the message across, you know, but they will have it. They will get it to you pretty, pretty quick, smart. Um, so if anyone needs some specific stuff, go and see them, talk to them. And they're only New Zealand, or do they? I ship believe. Well, I imagine they ship international. They they actually have a weekly standing order with Japan. So if you order on a Wednesday, you'll have whatever you ordered by the following Monday or something crazy, and it's direct from Japan. So um, it's pretty crazy. I was just thinking because Columns um, dropped a question there. Do you have a good supplier for draw slides sliders? Uh, um, he's yes. down in Adelaide. Would that... Oh, he's in Adelaide. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I need to talk to this. This company, Access Group, is just down the road from my warehouse. Um, they have a, a huge range of really good quality stuff, and it's cheap as chips. Um, I need to talk to them about whether they do international shipping because a lot of people ask me about about their stuff on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, so it's probably something okay. as well, but I can't say for sure if they do shipping at this point. Yeah, well, Colin, give them a, what was the name again, Joey? Access Group. Access Group hard, yeah. cabinet hardware, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, you mentioned that they good quality stuff for a low price. Yep. Is yep. it good quality stuff because it's brand names or is it good quality stuff because you've used it and you know that it's good quality? Um, there's a couple of branded pieces, but most of this stuff, is is a brand but it's probably nothing you know mm. um they i don't want to say knockoffs but it kind of is very similar to the stuff you get from blum a lot of their stuff yeah um, everyone's copying what blum have done so it's not really a surprise there um i just when when i see something that's going for a cheap price and it's not a brand name my immediate response is oh this is going to be some you know asian mm -hmm. knockoff yeah, in China. Not even going to waste my time with it. Um, so yeah, close-minded for something like hardware, where you know a hinge. While obviously you want it to be a certain quality, it's quite a simple thing. Yeah. It doesn't need 
astrophysicists going after it. Well, that's what you think. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's a really fancy hinge. What if it's going into space? <laughs> so when it comes to like draw runners, I think the best um, kind of comparison is, and I was really shocked when I found out that Blum have a lifetime guarantee on all of their stuff. If it breaks, you just take it back and they'll replace it. No questions asked. Mm. Well, that's crazy. Who else is going to do that? Well, it turns out Access Group do the same with their drawer hardware. Um, you buy one of their soft close drawers. If it breaks in the lifetime of that kitchen, which is a slight clause, but not really an issue. Mm. Um, if it breaks, they'll replace it. I mean, you can't really ask for better than that. Yeah. So, so sorry, just to clarify. So Blum, are they... Are they the supplier That's, or is that the, the brand of the, the actual? Blum, Blum is the brand of the kind of original Austrian engineered, high quality, um, heavy gauge steel. Mm. Everything's very much engineered. And I think a lot of other companies have kind of taken their designs and just reverse engineered them and kind of manufactured them themselves. Generally, it's with slightly less um, beefy parts and materials, but it works the same. Mm. Um, they're slightly different, but pretty much the same thing. Yeah. And um, that depends what the client wants. Sometimes clients will come to me and say, you can only put the best drawer runners you can find in my piece. And so, okay, well, I'll, I'll go to Blum and I'll get their stuff because that seems to be what everyone here knows. So, Oh, so you actually you specify with customers like, this is the hardware I want to use. These are the, the options that you have. Can put in some cheap junk, save you some yep. money. You might not have a, a door on your kitchen in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I can say, yeah, you can pay two dollars for a hinge or six dollars, and it could be soft clothes and all sorts of fancy stuff. Or we can just put like a, a butt hinge on it, and it will cost you fifty cents. <laughs> do you, do you go do you go go into that detail quite often with quoting? Because that just uh, seems like such a such a side thought for the customer, side. not for you, obviously. It depends on the size of the job. If there's like 70 drawers the cost of each drawer runner is going to add up very quickly and mm -hmm. so then i'll say right these are your six different options and each of them have got pros and cons um and you know knock on effects for each different option and so what, what way do you want to go <laughs> mm -hmm. so what um what styles of hardware would you say is your main you know you spent the most on in most projects would it be draw runners or hinges or yeah, your... they have to be draw runners probably and then hinges yeah and it's all like all soft clothes and all like euro you know concealed hinges yeah right because the, the reason why i kind of came up with this topic because i thought one would be kind of simple but two is i'm currently looking for some decent hardware but right. it's, it's actually been surprisingly difficult for me to find somewhere that is one local so i can actually go down and check it out in mm. person and know yeah, what i'm buying thing, yeah or two one which is name brand like you said uh blum or mm. you know obviously the american equivalent would be like Brusso or or yeah, whatever Lee or something like that yeah but actually finding someone which has it all in stock has been a pretty <laughs> big mission because i for one, I don't know exactly what I need, so I want yeah. to go down there and find something which I think to myself, oh, I can actually integrate this by just doing this. Mm. And there we go, I'll use these barrel hinges and that's fine. Mm. But to actually find somewhere that has that is being that's quite difficult. I've always had this kind of eye for hardware. If I'm in, a, in some random shop, I'll, I'll find something and go, all right, mental note, this shop has got this crazy oddball stuff. And if that ever comes up, I'll try and remember that I saw it in this <laughs> shop. Um, of course, these days I could probably take a picture of the shop with my phone or whatever. But um, so I've found with the bigger guys, like someone's just mentioned Hitech or Hitech. I don't know how you say say that word. Um, and um, Hefeli, I've tried to get accounts with those guys, and even Blum, they won't give me an account because I don't spend enough. Yeah. Um, and they want you to be spending twenty to thirty thousand dollars a month, <laughs> like, right? So, Jeez. and they're like, well, the only way you can buy our products is to go through a, a major store like Bunnings. Oh, that's great! They just put six hundred percent on the price of it, yeah. so um, it's not worth my while. 
And so that's when I found these other kind of other independent stores and suppliers. So I would say that you could surely find wholesalers to commercial, like kitchen manufacturers and stuff. There must be someone, even oh. talking to a, com a commercial kitchen manufacturer, they'd probably say who they, they deal with. I mean, actually, I could go next door to the kitchen shop next, well, yeah. across the road and ask them. It's That's just, right. uh, I'm, I'm shy. Is there a market for is there a market for your um, boutique hardware, like boutique as in they make it on site, they make to order, it's they replicate vintage stuff. Does that exist in the states? I actually buy a lot from the states direct um, through several different online stores because, and even from England, I've bought same kind of stuff because it's just easier. It's very difficult to get the the right size because I'm always converting bloody inches. Yeah. Um, but um, they have huge ranges on lines, and you can see the different quality types. And they have it's all it's all specified out. It's just a matter of wading through a thousand websites and finding one that works for you and is easy to use. And they will actually ship to you. And um, so that sometimes is it's more expensive. So I, I'll only do that for like special brass fittings or drawer locks, door locks and stuff that need like old fashioned skeleton keys and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Cause there's no supplies like that here. I recently purchased some small, I think they were 50 mil hinges. Um, I was going to use them on the bassinet that I made recently. Never, I've never bought hinges online and they look fairly decent, but that's obviously a, a stupid thing to say when you're buying online. <laughs> They actually turned out to be amazing. I didn't end up using them because they took too long, and I wanted to get the build out. But I'm from now on. I like I'm sold on the idea of buying hardware. I mean, obviously, it's only been one time, and it was a good experience. So they could change, but like for a first time, I'm pretty happy. The quality they they're yep. amazing. You know, I'll definitely go there. Right, instead of as someone who's you know not at the level that you guys are. Like for me, it's like Bunnings and Masters. That's where I get mm. my hinges from, mm. and. It's it's very very like um, small the range that you're going to get so yeah definitely give it a go online. George, yeah. What kind of stuff are you after? Is it like old like older style stuff or modern? Well, it's a lot of exposed, um, right. like so older hinges. They're going to be okay. basically in full view. So yeah. I just don't want Decorative. something that looks like it's cheap and going to fall apart. That's because a lot of the hinges that I get, which if I go to Bunnings and just grab something for a quick yeah, project. No, no, no. They do the job, but they're not. They don't look good. And mm -hmm. if you get close to it, you can see that the fold isn't actually closed. The Go pin to has a kick in it. And... Gurner hinges. So I've talked about Anton Gurner before. He's mm -hmm. a crazy awesome furniture maker. I believe he's in Melbourne or Sydney. I think maybe it's Melbourne. Um, he has a side project called Gurner hinges, where he imports his own solid brass. That's like essentially like Brusso hinges. Mm. And so he's got a small range, but they're very good butt hinges. Like it's like two mil solid thick brass plate. So I mean, right. they're awesome. Um, and so it's got, I think it's all in millimeters as well. So you can actually tell what the hell you're buying. Yeah, so um, I have found the Brusso stuff from the woodworks.com, right. like a store in Sydney. But of course, it's all two inch by one and an eighth yeah. inch. And it's like, right. My, what my, is that? And if I'm buying online and I can't figure out what size it is in front of me, it's, yeah. it's going to be pretty hard. So, so that would be your best bet for right. traditional style hinges. Um, yeah, cool. Gurner. Yep. But uh, the other thing, while it was in general, and just quickly, do you think there is a place, and this is for both of you, a place for brass screws in furniture and steel screws? Like, do you think one is better than the other? Because traditionally speaking, you would have brass, but steel is so much more durable and easier to use. Like, do you guys fall into that mindset? Because personally, I don't. I'll use a steel screw on anything that's not exposed. If it's exposed, I'll use brass. But yeah, pretty much that's it. If it's if it's going to be seen, it's going to be a brass flathead screw. Otherwise, it's just a steel square drive. Yeah, I believe there's a very 
niche space in hell for anyone who decides to use a flathead screw these days because <laughs> the amount of times I've just about thrown the door across the room trying to get it off the wall with these old painted over a million time flathead screw. Now, I know obviously that's a different scenario, but I just think the man who invented those was out to torture us because they are just the devil's work. Um, per personally, I don't mind using steel or um, even better stainless because it just looks a bit better, the screws. But I would only use this, you know, your silver colored screws for modern projects. I think if you want the antique look or the the traditional look, brass is obviously the way to go. But I don't, I've got no problem with using silver hardware. But I, I don't know. I just think it generally fits better with your, yeah. if, you, if you're making something modern. Like if, if I go to an art show and they've got an exhibit of furniture and I see that they're using a steel screw, I wouldn't give a crap. Like I still think that's a high value, very nice piece of furniture. And I wouldn't mm -hmm. take marks off for a steel screw being used or even to the next extreme. Oh, they're using a Phillips drive. There you go. That's five marks taken off right there. Like I, I just don't agree with that. I would that. give marks off for Phillips because <laughs> it's terrible. I who can use them. Yeah. I don't mind. I mean, obviously, if it's on the on the prime thing and it's the first thing you look at, probably I wouldn't want it. But I don't care. It's fine. No, I agree. Like I think only people like us care about the color of the screw head. But yeah. Is there a place yet for what's the square one? Uh, Robertson's. Well, that's Robertson? all I use. But I mean, as as a show face, is um, there a place well, for that yet, or is it still flat? The way to go. Depends what it is. Mm. I actually will probably if it was if I had to do a, a show face like a stainless screw head, I'd go to a star drive. Yeah. 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 Actually. Uh, yeah. I don't. I don't even think of those mm -hmm. then. Actually. What is it? Is it Pex or something? Yeah, something like that. I've, I've recently just bought a bunch of them, which is what I use for the tables I just put out for securing the top. And oh, change that's the user. Yeah, they're, they're, they're really nice. First time I've actually had them here. That's um, the is that the star because the star is different to hex heads. Yeah, yeah, it's not it's not a hex. I think it's called Pex. Yeah, something like e -E -X, that. I think. Oh, oh, right. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm yeah. With you. But really nice to use I'd, I'd stock up and solely those if i could but nowhere actually has the range i would need when i put the outdoor sofa together that i made at the beginning of the end of the last year um i used a 50 mil stainless screw with a star drive but the head was only like four mil across yeah i like noticed big, that really small as big as a um a, a jolt head nail yeah. and those things and they had a self drilling self tapping so you could just drill straight through the hardwood yeah. and those things were beautiful to use so that's what yeah. they use for decks isn't it with the really small head so those it's ones that actually apparently the ones i use they're meant to be for screwing cedar cladding on so instead of where you would want a small head like a nail it would traditionally be nailed on and they're screwing them these days because it's sometimes it's specified um so yeah okay all right. Um, we just hammer out this thing. Just hammer yeah. it out. <laughs> we were actually going to we were going to spend a lot less time on the topic tonight uh, <laughs> because we've got a very uh, got two very interesting questions. I actually had three, but we're not going to get to them. But unfortunately, as per usual, the show has run over time. So um, this particular question uh, came into me via an email this week, and. Um, I wanted to mention this question because the person who sent the question I thought was extremely diplomatic about the way they asked this question, which I appreciate. So I'm going to read the email. Um, I'll probably just miss out a couple of bits just for, from a time perspective. So it's it's from, from Dubs. Um, I'm not going to give away any more details than that just because I think reading the email, he doesn't particularly want you know to be too well known. Email reads, uh, the first line is, I'm curious, what you're about to read is not meant with any malice or ill intent. I'm simply curious as to why. And I read that and I thought, well, this is good. I'm going to get a cup of coffee for this one. Um, I subscribe to a few different woodworking channels and have done so for a long time. I call the channels for this purpose channel one and two. Both channels I have followed for a long time and in both cases have people that love what they do. Fast forward um, 
to having enough subscribers and channel <laughs> channel one has become intrusive with sponsorship and cutaway advertisements channel two has <laughs> has also become what i like to call the michael bay of woodworking videos <laughs> due to the blatant advertising of the particular model saw with the close-up shot in slow motion um, of said saw um while, whilst I still enjoy the channels um, by staying subscribed and viewing the content, I can't help but question their motives for doing what they do anymore. And despite the high video quality, the quality, the quality of the video still takes a dive for me due to the ads. My question for the sh questions for the show are, where do you think the line is between making content the priority over advertisements? And does editing videos take such a toll on you that you begin to lose motivation for creating videos in the first place so as, as i mentioned i like the fact that this person hasn't said advertisements are bad or advertisements are good it's nice to see someone ap appreciating the grayness of this um so joey we talked about this briefly before i know you've got a pretty solid view on it well possibly i mean i uh i, I don't know where the line is i do mm. Uh, he mentions in the email that you missed that part, but he mentions about people, uh, creators making videos solely based on an, uh, a sponsor's product. And yep. if the product didn't exist, then that video would never have existed. I think we're probably all in agreement that those videos are usually pretty terrible and mm -hmm. really is just a, a way for them to make a buck. Um, and the content is not inspired or it's just is what it is. And so that seems to me pretty useless. Um, I made a conscious decision after trying to get sponsors for my channel to just not have any sponsors. I will not have any sponsors in the future. Um, I, and my conscious right at the very start was that I'm just going to let my work speak for itself and eventually people will catch on and view that work. And that seems to have paid off. Um, that is a completely different scenario if you are relying solely on youtube to live off and so i guess you have to make some hard decisions about what your content is going to be because you need to get some some views so it's a difficult position to be in um i guess you just need to accept that if someone is doing content creation full time their content may be up and down as far as quality mm. Jordan? Yeah, I, I agree uh, mostly, but I think there's a big, it's, it's difficult for me to answer it because I'm not relying on my content creation as my job. Like, right, my job is being a furniture maker and I feel it on the side because I find it fun and people watch it and I like sharing my kind of passion with people out there in the public. The little bit of revenue that I make is nice but it's certainly nowhere near enough to pay for even you know any of my bills really. So from my standpoint, I've never really looked at creating content to make money and therefore getting advertisers or sponsors have never been a big deal. But I will say that when a channel is sponsored and all I see is that particular sponsor's products and I get those little pop up things in the bottom saying head over to uh, the bear and purchase this, this link and all of that sort of crap. It just annoys, annoys me because one, I'm not watching this video because I want to buy this bloody tool. I'm watching this video because I want to watch you make a bookcase. So like I, I get annoyed at it, but when it's done well, and an example of someone that does it well is uh, Chris Salomon, mm -hmm. in my opinion, he does it quite well because Occasionally, he'll do that cutaway segment talking about, I think it's Grizzly is his sponsor, mm, and he'll, he'll yeah. do the cutaway, but the extent of that is generally not the focus of the the episode, so to speak. So I think, I guess I would say the line is when the priority or the focus is the sponsor, you've crossed the line. Yeah, true. Where if mm. it's supplementing and saying, hey, Hey, this sponsor is supporting me and it means that I can actually do this full time and make these kick-ass videos and it's why you guys have subscribed. Um, that's good. So there is a line. I think it's just you have to keep the focus in check. Yeah, that makes sense. 
For yeah, me. my my only qualm with what you've said is, as someone who's doing this, who who started doing this purely from a content creation perspective. So I've sort of been the opposite of what you guys have done. Mm. I find it frustrating that I have to walk this line the whole time <laughs> yeah. when all I'm trying to do is make this my income. Right. But I've got to be so conscious of annoying people. And and when you when you say like now don't now don't get me wrong, I understand I, I agree with what you guys are saying, but I just feel like us as content creators have have been cornered into this really frustrating bit where I want to I want to make a living out of this, but I've I've got to be so careful that I'm going to upset you <laughs> with my progress. <laughs> and like, yeah, why, sure. why do you hate me so much that you're not <laughs> letting me progress? Um, so it's 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 super tricky. Um, and I, you know, I've talked about it before as well with the sponsors. I've just stopped it just because the net gain is 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 never there. It's never there. No. But at the same time, when when I'm watching particularly smaller creators and and they're doing an ad read i will watch that ad read because right. that's them going somewhere doing something because you know advertising exists all around us we don't mm. turn off our tv because i'm so tired of adverts you, I mean, you know I <laughs> well, <that is> <laughs> now, I'm, now i'm not saying that i'm not saying that we should all then just submit and, and just accept it but at the same time like that's 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 almost that's almost part of it, and it's part of that content creator's growth. So, I, I guess on one hand, I'm with you guys, and then it's 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 hard to define the line. And when there was there was a video that came out a couple of days ago, I'm not going to mention who it was, but they put out a video, and it was clearly blatantly just to promote a product. Right. The, the video was it was a short video about a just non-topic. To promote a new product and that's it's funny that's one of the first times that i've watched that and gone oh, uh, i kind of I, I feel dirty inside having watched this video <laughs> but for the most part yeah like i i want i want to i want to watch people's adverts because i know that that's going to keep our content and our community growing because then that's where the money is and then you know the businesses will follow suit I think yeah. like back, back when my channel was growing quite rapidly before it died and I decided to shut it down and start a new one, what I got out of advertising more than anything as a creator was getting annoyed that all of these like American channels are getting these great sponsors, but here in Australia, we don't have anyone offering that. So yeah. like that was also a really big difficulty for me is not, actually having anyone anyone to really go and approach saying hey this is what i'm doing i mean I, I obviously there's bosch and a few companies that will send tools out but they won't become a channel sponsor they'll just mm. support video so and that's the cultural thing that i'm talking about over in the states there's advertising everywhere all the time yeah i'm mean, seeing the value in it obviously so yeah that's the that's the culture whereas here yeah i think people just immediately get turned off if they if yeah. something's getting forced down their throat well, why don't we cut this short and then we pick up maybe next week and, and do a whole episode on this maybe. Yeah, it's it's a real it's a real interesting topic. Um, unfortunately, we run out of time as usual. Um, but yeah, um, okay. One other one other question. We'll keep this super quick um, because I did want to um, put this one in. I said I would. Uh, any okay? So this is from M M M. MB John, MB I J on, uh, I think that's how you say the name. Sent through a question on Instagram. Love you guys. Love the podcast, by the way. Any chance you guys could talk about how tough one wood is to work with versus another? A lot of us tend to get stuck with whatever is cheap locally, but the three of you probably worked with a lot of different woods and know what eats blades uh, and what tears out bad. So I guess the question is, um, uh how tough one wood is to work with versus another so i guess how you would handle something like jordan here in australia like jarrah or something with a high silica count um do you steer away from that over something a bit softer because you know that it's going to put a lot of stress on your tools or do you just do you, are you just using the whatever the wood you know whatever the client wants 
that's the wood. Uh, okay, I like a really hard wood here is one do. It's one of the densest timbers there are, is out there, and I will avoid using it at any cost because it will literally shatter the carbide off of your saw blades and outer bits. Boom. That said, people want one do, and if they want one do, then I, I do it, it, but I do add on to that cost, the cost of the sharpening, the professional sharpening, because it's going to happen. Um, do yeah. I avoid woods? Or I mean, I, I wouldn't say I avoid woods, but I do try and guide clients to woods which <laughs> yeah. I know how to work with and know yeah. how to react. Like, yeah. you know, Vic Ash, while it's pretty easy to work with, I know that it will tear, tear out sort of its grain structure. So... If but that's I, more about you know how it works, not yeah. Not so like, oh, this is like I'm going to be putting a rock through my sword. Exactly it's right. So it's just I'm considering these things. So if I want something that's a little bit lighter, easier to work with, and more stable, I will advise the client about these other options. But if they've got their heart set on something, I'll I'll do it. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that answers the question. But <laughs> Joey, any yes. woods that you stay away from because they're just uh, too hard? Purple heart is pretty difficult to work with. It's that, difficult yeah. to get a smooth finish. It's difficult to avoid burning, and burning in that case means means a really dark purple streak, which is very hard to get out. You kind of have to just cut that off. Um, so it's yes, yeah, difficult to get an even color because the color changes as your if you get tear out in one spot, it's going to be a different purple than the smooth, um, straight grained pieces. So it can be difficult. It's fine if you're just using making a gate or something out of it. It doesn't have to be pretty. But if you're making draw sides out of it, like I did, and stupidly, uh, it's very difficult to make it look nice. <laughs> right. Cool. Fair enough. I've never found a wood too hard to work with that. Um, so I don't have too much to add to that. Um, I guess sure. one day it will happen. But for now, I'm. <laughs> I'm still pretty small on my selection. All right, everyone. Well, that's the show for tonight. Um, as Joey said, I think we'll touch on this topic again. I've just noticed all the comments in yeah. the, the comment <laughs> section. So clearly you guys want to talk about this. Um, let's dedicate an episode to it coming up, and then we can really dive into some questions. Um, so before we end off, I just want to make a quick note. Again, 5th of May, we're going to be down at the Malini Wood Expo, and on – the 5th of May that evening, we'll be in Brisbane for a meetup. I will have the event details in the description shortly after this video. Thanks, everyone, for jumping in. Uh, everyone in the chat, thanks very much for being involved, as always. And we'll see you guys again next Thursday, 7 p.m., same time, same place. See ya. Bye.